and a very warm welcome to this special edition of the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV brought to you by the Center for Constitutional Governance. I am Isaac Kwagala, your host. On today's program, we pay tribute to the life, memory, and legacy of the Honorable Cecilio Gua, the Member of Parliament representing Dokolo District in Northern Uganda. We now understand that the late passed on a few weeks ago, and in paying tribute and commemorating her legacy, we discussed the broader question of women participation in politics in Uganda. Joining me now to make sense of today's topic is a panel of very distinguished people, two ladies and one gentleman. You're most welcome to the show. Let me introduce them. Uh, right next here to me on my left. Winfred Mugambo, how are you today? Um, I'm fine. Say hi to the viewership. Hello everyone. Um, I, will, I, will, I will say happy liberation day, like as it, it is today. I'm Winfred Mugambo, I'm an eco-feminist and a woman human rights defender. I work with Rights for Uganda. And I'm um, privileged and happy for CCG for always inviting us and involving us. It's a pleasure to have you, Winnie. Thank you. Right next to Winnie is Council Chiza Aaron. Council, you're most welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's always a, a deep delight for me to be in the company of these two special guests, very knowledgeable. And um, of course, it's a pleasure to share with the viewers some insights on how this country is misgoverned or sometimes governed, but most times it's misgoverned. And that's why I think that um, the very idea of uh, so-called liberation day, when for so many they were not liberated, and when it is a partisan event, um, converting it into a national holiday is uh, very suspicious. So. For me, I'm not uh, excited that we are spending resources on a day pro of propaganda. Mm. Yeah, regime propaganda. That's a serious charge, Council. The truth is always serious. Thank you, Council, for that introduction. <laughs> right next is <laughs> Charity Ahimbi Siwe. Charity, I haven't seen you in the new year. Happy New Year, I've interacted with uh, the, two, the two previously. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to Say you. hello to the viewership. Yeah, very happy New Year to the viewers of Citizen TV. And especially my followers in the diaspora. They've been asking me, where are you? Why aren't you there? We don't see you on CCTV here. I am back, ladies, gentlemen, feel at home. You even told me to say for God and my country. I have said it's for God, it's for my country that I say the things that I say. I don't know how you got my numbers, but I am happy that you've been interacting with us. So back to us today, Saturday. It's um, a beautiful day because we reflect on a woman that has focused her life fighting for the rights of others. She didn't relent. She was principled. She stood by the principles. And she wore every jacket possible to her to achieve her agenda. So I look forward to this conversation. About Liberation Day, I don't know who named it Liberation Day. It's actually NRM Day. And I think we are better off sticking with NRM Day. Thank you, Charity. You're most welcome. Thank you. To our esteemed viewership, once again, this is the Focus on Parliament show. Now we begin off with a moment of silence to commemorate the patriotic contribution of the late Honorable Cecilia Ogwa, the woman member of parliament representing Dokolo district in Northern Uganda, in honor of her patriotic contributions to our country. May her soul rest in peace. Let me start with you, Charity. 
invariably from uh, people that have come out to pay tribute to the late Honorable Cecilia Ogwa. She has been described as an emblem of democracy and good governance and the champion of woman emancipation and empowerment. What was your initial reaction when uh, news broke out that uh, the Honorable Cecilia Ogwa had passed on? My initial reaction was that she probably was killed. Then I thought, eh, but from where? Then the second reaction was I, I needed to find information and the information was she was in India. How did she end up in India? Her death, you know, happened like to a sudden. And then the speaker came out almost immediately to say, her condition wasn't when we were at the speaker's conference. Then I said, okay, now isn't it back to our conspiracy theories? I kept waiting for information to flow in. But as it turns out, it is just one of those unfortunate times when God decides to call his servant home. So we uh, are sad with the family. My heart goes out to the family. I made out that uh, we had to accept that at 77, she was going, but she has been in parliament for 28 years. Her influence, therefore, is distinguished. And uh, as a Democrat, she worked with UPC. She has recruited women. By the way, the women themselves were talking. Miriam Atembe says she influenced her. We had uh, the Speaker of Parliament speaking, how she was picked up from a bank in Soroti. She didn't ever know she was going to become a politician, but uh, the Honorable Cecilia Ogwal picked her up and convinced her she would teach her how to speak. She also influenced Alisa Lasso, uh, then Jane Ruth Acheng. All those are her babies. And then she has very many women that didn't come out who are in the women movement, but they do associate with the work that she did across the years that she's been in parliament. One thing about her is that she was straightforward. She said she spoke her mind. And the speaker says that every time she veered off the path of the citizen, the first person in her office was the late Cecilia Ogwal to remind her that, you see, the reason why people go into service is to serve the people, not the reverse, to serve themselves. So she was all the time mentoring her and telling her, let's get what the people want. And for me, that is then a voice that we have lost, a very critical voice that cared for the citizen. We don't see very many politicians that are paying attention to citizens now. No, everybody is in it for what is in it for me. What can I get out of there? How much can I eat? Who do I ally with to get the quickest money that is available at my desk? And I move on. We hardly will see a member of parliament that is focused on the agenda of the people. Now, if we had more voices like hers, I'm certain then so many things would have changed. But what is interesting about her is that she has also been very balanced. Balanced in a sense that she was able to work with UPC at the time when multi-party politics was not yet uh, open in Uganda. That time when movement system was the only movement, it was only the, the only system that was available she remained in the background working with UPC and did not stop wearing her red T-shirt and saying for her she was UPC. And then when she started working with FDC, she even up to the time FDC has been pulling ropes against each other, she was able to tell FDC, you must pull yourselves back together. The political party must go ahead. To the extent that when she died, FDC released the program for her burial. And yet Parliament was also releasing a program for her burial. So we see a parliamentary commissioner serving government and government interests, and yet at the same time able to work comfortably with the opposition from where she came from. What usually happens is this. When uh, members leave the opposition and they join government, they go and override you know, they become the most NRM, so yellow, so distinguished at being yellow and terrorizing the 
opposition. But why don't you talk about the speaker and the deputy director? <laughs> why <are> you? <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe they are not the <laughs> only ones. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they are not the only ones that have moved and then became so yellow and you know forgot values of other citizens. Maybe they are not the only ones. Actually, I have a big list of many people that have crossed from opposition and gone, and and they end up that way. But Cecilia remained with the facet of, yes, I could have come from there, I am serving with these people, but what is the greater good? For her, it was about country. For her, it was about democracy. For her, it was about the citizen. Mm. Yes. Country, democracy, and the citizen. Yes. Council, you yourself, you are quite a distinguished champion for human rights observation here in Uganda, and also for, uh, you know, the furtherance of the rule of law and good governance. The only distinction being that uh, Cecilia Gual was not a lawyer, and you are <clears throat> not a parliamentarian, but in many respects, you have uh, areas of common convergence. So I ask the question from uh, a legal point of view, especially the rule of law and good democratic governance practices, what would be your perspective? Oh, I mean, she was a colossal figure. She was a giant as a politician, and she did so with grace and tenacity. As Charity clearly said, she was very candid, very honest, very forthright. I didn't, I think, for most of my life, I really was looking at her as a hero from a heroine from a distance, an icon that the rest of the world looks at her as. And I think there was one brief moment when that convergence of human rights and rule of law, which she was really interested in, had to bring us together. And I remember those values that they were talking about, they were coming out. She was very passionate, she was very honest, and there's some project we were working on and the, the then president of the Uganda Law Society actually was a lady with Sebatimla and she had also mentored her and she was telling her I mean how she was happy that that from that moment Ruth was coming out for that cause that we are working on together so that for me was a very golden moment in her company seeing her work at uh, cross range and really bring those values that she exposed in the room where I was. It was a very big, big, big honor. Her death, for me, it feels like really the, 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 the passing of a generation. We have very few of her caliber left in terms of even age, but more so on what they represented. People who really were patriotic. Because most politicians we have now cannot be said to be patriotic. Most are selfish, most are greedy, most are hungry, most are really in for feeding their stomachs. And the last person they think of is the citizen, is, is the voter. And the politics has been commercialized, but she was not in for the trade. Um, for very many years, she was a champion of women's rights. But more than women's rights, she was a champion of human rights across the board, the rule of law. She fought ferociously for the restoration of Maritpati, the Maritpati dispensation. Mm. She saw NRM in the eye, and it was not NRM system, it is one party state. Of course, disguising as a system, but it was never a system. It was a one party state disguising itself, calling itself with such a flowery phrases as a broad best. Individual merit. I mean, individual merit will always shine through, whether it's multipartism or not. But they had this linguistic, uh, uh, propagandistic way of uh, of uh, running rings around our legal order and claiming that they, they were that one party which was for all Ugandans. So it was a form of dictatorship. It was a form of institutionalized intolerance. And it was nothing more than really the NRA, not even just the movement, but the army the, that was calling all the shots. 
but Cecilia or Aunt Cecilia as of you know referred to her stood against that ferociously at one point and it was at the difficult time it was one of those difficult times when it was not easy to criticize the narrative because then it was still the they were the new kids on the block mm, largely speaking DP was on board with them which was the strongest opposition group when they came in to, to the regime they had overthrown so it was a thankless job it was a Herculean task opposing a popular a popular regime led by someone who Bill Clinton had clustered among the new breed of African leaders whom who had fooled the West into believing that they would rule briefly and then hand over power and then be architects of orderly succession and democracy. Of course, we know that none of the so-called new breeders actually lived up to that promise. And the worst culprit is the one we have somewhere celebrating uh, a misreading, pretentious liberation day for his party, but trying to, to, to include all Ugandans uh, by really by proclamation and clearly people would want to work today I don't see why people are not working but because people who want to force it down our throats that we are liberated liberation is like love it is not something to, in, to institutionalize if we are liberated we know it we look in our pockets and see the liberation there we see that we can go to city square and protest without police and without the military tents out competing us. Makerere University, even the Freedom Square is now locked. So that is the liberation these guys are. You can't even go in the street and demonstrate peacefully. No, you can't even approach parliament now. You are a youth. At some point, you young people would go to parliament and demonstrate there. Right now, you can't even go there. If, even if you have papers like a petition, you will be arrested. Several have been arrested blocked by the youth so it was it, it this intolerance has kept on increasing but the Sicilians were not hoodwinked like some Ugandans they saw it for what it was from the word go Sicilia worked with Obote while Obote was staged in Arusha the as a head of the what policy she was the de facto head of, of UPC working with the likes of the late Rwanyarare oh so I don't know the retired uh, one the man from Uruchiga and all those big wigs of, 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 of UPC so her patriotism were beyond question she mirrored down she mirrored down we don't towards the end she was not the same Cecilia but she maintained that the balance she was talking about maybe it was age maybe it was disease because sometimes you ask why is someone mirroring down you don't know that who knew that she was struggling with cancer for example mm -hmm. we didn't know mm -hmm. and you know how debilitating cancer can be uh, it can drain your energy so the fact that she was even uh, doing all of this work up to this age when she had the cancer shows you what a kind of uh, solid woman she was everyone who has tried to help save this country has wanted to enlist her help the fdc the upc DP and of course even NRM, they all want to work with her and it's because she was a magnet, it's because she was knowledgeable and because she was solid, she had the metal, she had that tenacity because the tenacity is very important and I keep emphasizing this because it's not easy to be on an issue as a rule of law for that long period of time. There is fatigue, there is stress, there is burnout. And then there is a distraction, and of course there is a compromise. So if someone runs that race for that long, you have to credit them. Mm, credit them indeed. Winnie, uh, what's your understanding of the legacy of the late Honorable Seri Ogwal? Did you have any close personal interaction with her for the period she was alive? Or from a distance, what can you tell us? Uh, thank you so much. Personally, I had not, um, I would say always, even if we shared, we have shared, I have shared space with her, but we had not yet met. We had not met. But she's one kind of woman that 
we have lost as a country, we have lost someone, indeed a person. Given these times where most people in the positions of influence, most leaders, most ministers, most MP are forgotten my stomach. And everyone has told you, everyone has given testimony that this lady was a honorable, was, a, was forgotten my country. But it's a time where everyone is looking at her for good and my stomach, losing such a person who was so influential and kept up the game till the end. It's, it's, really, it's really disheartening. I personally have shared space with her. And uh, one thing I, 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 I learned from her, one, one most, I learned a lot because she's been an echo in the women's movement and women have lost a lot. Having a woman who will stand up because when you see in the politics of Uganda, most times women face a lot of intimidation and uh, very many violences that many times it keeps women go, go what? Go back. But Cecilia Ogawal, you've heard everyone is talking about how she has been still the same person only at the last hour, but she's been the same. And coming from the rural setting, Talking about political or women issues when you're coming from the grassroots, it is not an easy thing. But uh, like I was telling you, one thing I learned from this lady was personally that when you fear God, when you let God be in front of you, you can speak to power anywhere at any one time. You can always you firmly raise your voice, but it, it's one of the things that I took away from her. And um, we've seen in the parliament, she's been talking about all issues, regardless, even if it's the president, she's been speaking about it. And like I said, I also learned from her, even when I have never interacted with her, I have never even come close to her or even worked around their area she was working, like maybe in the same settings. But we have shared space. I've had her speak. And she would speak... Um, words inspirational and what encouraging words that i believe touched very many women you would see given the women who have come out but and of the many because i work with very many women from the grassroots and from up country and very many women have learned from honorable cecilia Galgalet. and um to me as a believer sometimes as you can like console yourself You'll be like, I, uh, when I was thinking about her death and everyone was like, we've lost someone. I also thinking about how we have lost someone. How are we going to do it? Then I got this in my head where Jesus told his, uh, his disciples when they were telling, telling him, please don't leave us. And Jesus said, I must go so that he can come, the comforter. So I believe, I believe there is that, that person even when Cecilia has, di has died, there is that one person that ha is going to replace Cecilia who is going to come up and also raise her voice, her voice like she did. And um, her, her confidence, it is rare to find someone with such kind of confidence. I was surprised when I got to know that she's not a lawyer. I was really surprised because I, she was so articulate. She understood law like as if she she was a lawyer. And then I, and in that, another thing I learned from her is read research, give your time, time to understand things, and always speak about what you understand and understand best. And again, um, when you see on the floor of parliament, even when at her old age, there have been very many issues that she would pick up what she believed in. Personal as a, a human rights defender, I would maybe where a person I would cross like, no, the, on this path, we didn't move, move with her person. I didn't move with her where she voted the aha. Uh -huh, I wouldn't have voted it. But that doesn't stop me from admiring her courage. That doesn't stop me from appreciating the work she has, she has done in many people's lives, even in my life. Because we've learned, not only personally, I've learned that you can pick some things from someone, even when you have somewhere you you crossroads, and um, and uh, given given now, uh, given where she's coming from. Right now, as a human rights friend, I was telling you that we do the work we do in different in different spaces and in different geographical locations. When we say that Cecilia of Gara has died at seventy seven. 
and she has spent in parliament 28 years. To me, I go back and say, okay, at around, uh, she must have, have started around her 20s. And then I'm looking at the Lila I know now, and I tell myself, 50 or 40 years back, how was that place for a woman? If women right now in Lila can be intimidated, Lila is a place where a woman doesn't just hold, like, have land. You have to have a, a man. I, I heard that a man has, you have to go with a man even uh, to acquire land or even, even buy land. There is a lot of uh, uh, sexual gender-based violence in Lila. And I'm like, I was seated then. Like, this is a woman 40 years back still stood up and raised her voice uh, in areas, uh, political areas and women's issue. By then, women were so much, even right now, women are, are, are so much are silenced um, with a, so much of a structure, structural silence. But when you relate that, if now the rate at which it is, what about then? So she's a woman to be separate, celebrated not only now at her death, not only that, then when she wasn't, uh, when, when she was still alive, but it, she's a woman that her life we must, must, not even we have to, we must celebrate to the, to the end. Uh, NRM celebrating her death and even having that, uh, that, uh, that um, taking up the ceremony, to me I'm like, I ask myself, are they going, what are they, what are they, how are they going to celebrate that it will leave a mark forever? What is that they're planning to put there? If they're really saying that, okay, this woman is a, is a unique woman, a different woman from other women, because she has really worked. You, I had the president's, uh, president's speech about Cecilia, and she said she was a bridge uh, of uh, um, NLM and then opposition. So to me, I feel, only celebrating her, talking about uh, talking about her name, uh, having those uh, that ceremony, uh, a very powerful ceremony at death. They need to go beyond that. They need to put that because in you, not only in Uganda, many times when we lose someone, when someone dies, we'll speak about that person, and then only those who are close to them will forever maybe go and speak about her. But later we start now forgetting. But you. The president, the way she, he talked about, and even the, the member of the speaker, the way they were talking about this woman, and whatever, every testimony that everyone has said, I feel and I, I, I request if, if the president can and if the president is watching, he needs to put there something memorial that even when someone comes in, and my, I, I, me, I wouldn't even only love it to be in leader. Yes, let something be in leader where he was, she was coming from. But remember, whenever we get visitors, they pass them around Kampala Central Region, around where they, where it matters to them. So for Cecilia, as a woman who has impacted not only women, she has impacted men, she has impacted youth, she has impacted the whole country. We need to create, the present needs to create a memorial place for her. May her soul rest in peace. Charity, when Fred here makes two interesting observations. Number one, she says that the late Cecilia Ogol was someone that you would respect uh, even when you disagreed with her. But secondly, she makes reference to the president's uh, eulogy of the late where he said that uh, the late Cecilia was a bridge between the ruling NRM party and the opposition to the extent that she is someone who never painted or cast the country in bad light, even with uh, all her you know, uh, profile and her numerous interactions with the outside world. But then it begs the question, given the NRM's human rights record. The gross human rights record was that sincere praise or the president uh, did it out of the need maybe to you know, placate the wider public and I you know put up a front as a Democrat. What do you make of that? So now are we analyzing the president or do we want to keep our focus on Cecilia? We are analyzing his speech in view of Cecilia. The context of what he said in light of Cecilia Ogwaro's legacy. 
So, of course, the president, if you, if you have been very observant, he has hardly sat in parliament to pay tribute to all the four members that died before Cecilia Ugwa, including the fact that he loved Dolanya, but he didn't go to spend a night there. But he sat for some time at Cecilia Ugwa's funeral. And that tells you something, that by the time she was dying, he was close to her. And by the, he didn't go alone. He went with his wife. Usually his wife will leave him to go alone if it is a person as close to him and not to her. But they went together. And while there, actually his facial expression tells you, he doesn't usually look like that, like he's in shock, like, you know. He normally just lays his uh, wreath and then he moves on. But this time he was looking like he's in deep contemplation. Uh, when he made mended fences with Cecilia Ogwal, and I, I'm coming back to the speech, but I first want to come from the context. He said, this my sister used to say very painful things to me. Very painful I didn't know there was a day we are going to meet, agree, and even hug that day when they mended fences. He said she had said very, very um, painful things that he didn't think he could uh, mend fences with her. But uh, to understand his speech of she defended the country even, even against her uh, against what they thought. When she was going to the parliamentary forum abroad, she was a commissioner for the um, uh, parliamentary, she was a parliamentary commissioner, but representing Uganda at uh, the parliamentary forum. So when she was going for the first, the first time she went, it was during Kadaga's uh, tenure as speaker. They were so afraid that she was going to go and bash the country and, and give the human rights record that you've been talking about. But while on the plane, and this Rebecca Kadaga said on the floor of parliament, she, she called Rebecca and said, you don't worry about me. I'm not going to criticize government. I'm going to defend my country because I am a Ugandan. And the bigger thing is that the country comes before my sentiments as a person. Now, and I think when you listen to what Miriam Atembe said of her in All Saints Cathedral, Miriam said, at times I look like I am the, the more radical one than Cecilia would have been. That I wish I could pick a bit of her balance and know how to play around with the two, the radical and the balance that Cecilia had. That is the context under which then the president makes the statement that he makes. Do you believe he was sincere in those statements? You know, because it's very difficult to, to gauge he seems to, he seems to paint. <laughs> he seems to paint the impression that uh, if you have maybe someone like Cecilia in the ranks of the opposition who can cooperate with you, then it makes uh, your work easy to govern and manage the country as opposed to having more radical elements like Dr. Vesije, and Bobby Wine, whom he even made reference of while giving that eulogy. Uh, so contextually. You know, for me, I will stick with Cecilia. I don't want to go into calling Dr. Vesige radical because he also has his own um, um, inclination and his own conviction why he has done the things he has done. And I don't think that Dr. Vesige, if for anything, has done those things for benefit. What did he get from being in the trenches, being beaten, pepper sprayed, kicked? Losing his brother. Uh, you know, kicked around. What has he benefited in terms of putting in his pocket, if we have to think about it? Even when they accused him of a petrol station, all these things they have levied against him. But when he came out, are there some things he has said? Are there things he has done that eventually caused government to take action? For example, the road to Rukunjiri. Would it have been tarmacked? 
I know Tunengo is not yet tamaked and every day I keep thinking maybe we should go opt him and take him to the hill in Kanungu and make him now scream from on top of the hill that you know even here I'm going to change these people to become reform agenda is such that government takes chorus up that hill as well but we haven't got the chorus there but for him to Rukunjiri he has it and he kept saying you Ugandans well for you you think that me I've made noise and I've got nothing I have tamak to my house because government has heard what I have said so what has Besije in terms of um, individual benefit what has he got for shouting all these 20 years I think there are some things he has done in terms of democracy to help citizens so I would not go into criticizing Dr Kiza Besije that would be very unfair the president is entitled to say what he wants to say about Kiza Besije to say what he wants to say about Robert Chagulanyi Sentamu but I may not as a political analyst be fair enough to take the same path like the president took but I will stick with uh, Cecilia Ogwa now uh, sometimes I, I think when the president talks about being over radical he wants uh, an opposition that yes you've shouted and told me this but when do we meet when do we agree on something and say this is for us as a country he one time came out and said power and electricity he was being failed to generate electricity for uganda and he was failing to generate electricity for uganda because of my friends like Aaron who were saying no the environment is being destroyed and actually when you look through the academic spectrum environment has become a very interesting one there are people who are saying we must balance environment rights with development rights at what point do you give up some of your rights in the environment to take on development now that is a kind of attitude yours truly rip honorable cecilia ogwal had her attitude was at what point do we give up something to gain another and does it benefit all of us as a country and i think to her she rather erred on the side of trying to make it work than era on the side of where she thought it's now completely not working and 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 so for the president to see her in that light that she gave in uh she agreed to listen to him over some issues and it benefited both government and the opposition then becomes a fair comment to give about the person of Cecilia herself as a politician that said it doesn't mean that uh, people who are radical have no contribution on the democratic spectrum no they also have a contribution on the democratic spectrum and i think that the president knows too well that uh, if he had no opposition and if he had no person giving him alternative policy all the people who are around him and very happy to be psychophants would have already caused him to knock his head on the wall so if i were him i'd be happier with alternative voices council in principle i find it quite inconsistent that um, given the character of the president he's a person that uh, whom you can constructively politically cooperate with therefore contextually i am not at a personal level persuaded with his remarks when he says that uh, he found uh, an ally in the honorable cecilia ogwal in as far as furthering national interest is concerned but i want to understand from you do you think uh, this praise was sincere or it was out of the need to appease uh, maybe the greater public or also for the president to try and revive his uh, political and human rights record because like now it, it's the norm we all know that uh, this regime is arguably the most brutal in the history of our country well to, to say that uh, Cecilia was uh, iconic he heroic is not to say that she was an angel or that she was perfect maybe that was one of uh, the drawbacks of her real great iconic legacy that she 
she had to dine and cooperate with a man she knows to be thoroughly cunning and ensure they were a uh, Machiavellian president was not making those remarks because uh, does not mean that that is the, the brightest star on her on her great flag that she left yeah, in this country. No, 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 no. Museven was playing politics. Museven was being Museven. She was being patronizing. He was undermining opposition. He was trying to say that the, only those who work with me mean well. Yet, he's there to maintain a regime whose human rights record is abhorrent. Is, 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 he's, it's a military dictatorship that Museven presided over. He's not presiding over a democracy. He's not trying to entrench a pluralistic society. He's trying to, he typifies intolerance. So, so, um, those are, if there is one thing that you, I wouldn't tick on uh, Cecilia's great career, it is that Seven is saying good things about her. Be suspicious when wrong guys are, are saying good things about you yeah so the people who are really making this suffer country suffer in terms of human rights the president the speaker we are all now trying to sing praises and this was just patronizing and if they had really, really true respect for her within the eyes of the progressives in uganda they would just have kept it their side and kept it general but to try to tell us that Cecilia was a bridge between the opposition and NRM. That I don't think is a big plus. For it's good from seven, but it, it, it's not good for opposition. The people who are sitting in trenches and so on and so forth. So it's it's it, it was common knowledge. It was common background knowledge that uh, Cecilia at some point started working with seven. We all knew that, but like she said, it didn't take away the respect that people had for Cecilia. Cecilia was in her own class. She represented that patriotic group. And even when she was working with the regime, she, she, she maintained the balance. She didn't swallow everything the regime gave her, uh, hook, line, and sinker. There were some other non uh, Jenny come lately. People, uh, the, the way they have been doing, they, they try to be hourier than the pop, more NRM than the original. No, she didn't. She didn't attempt that. So she was uh, as graceful, as honorable you can be in working with uh, the seven. And it was, it is a difficult job. Even then, even that difficult job, even that landmine in which she found herself in, she performed with dignity. Mm. You get me? Mm. So for me, the remarks are not sincere. They are political. They are patronizing. And... Uh, they have to be judged. Cecilia has to be judged in the whole picture. It's not that it's a big plus, but it doesn't take away her shine. At the end of the day, she was a human being who was a, an a, a extraordinary in talent, extraordinary in talent, in grace, in compassion, tenacious, uh, but uh, she was by no means an angel. Thank you, Council. Winfred, let us situate the Honorable Cecilia Ogao now. Uh, in the full picture as an icon of women in emancipation and uh, empowerment in Uganda. Today, we have a rather distressing, distressing state of affairs uh, in the uh, fact that we see women leaders have increasingly, uh, you know, clawed back on some of the progress, the likes of the Cecilia Girls, the Milia Matembes, had registered the progress, especially in the political space. What do you think is fundamentally the problem, and how can this be cured? Before I get, I go to that. I just want to add something on our president's remark. Um, every year, uh, the president gives out medals, right? And uh, why would he even wait only? At the death to give this speech, so I would agree with Aaron. What Aaron, Council Aaron, is saying that it was uh, it was political, and um, 
Museven has mastered a game, the president has mastered the game being of strategic. He will use a situation to try and manipulate other people's mind, minds. To me, I feel his speech was one, of, one targeting other opposition leaders to manipulate their mind, to think that otherwise about the late, to even to them to think otherwise, can I also now become the bridge? And um, the other the other reason I would give of this speech is um, is um, is uh, why I asked my, I already asked us why at this time if really Museveni has always come out to praise people he has always given out medals they they give out medals is it now on the liberation day to yesterday that they gave out medal medal he does the heroes day also. it is heroes day so if really this woman meant all this. He said in the speech, it means the speech was very good. Why did he wait at the death? And, uh, and uh, then the last one, maybe he was saying it from what he has learned from her. Maybe the bridge was like, like how everyone has learned from, from, from the let. Maybe also Museveni learned a lot from her. And that is where he's coming from. But it was, it was really political. For him, he, has a, he had a reason. I'm not trying to judge him, but the truth of the matter, if you sit down and analyze it, he was having at the back of his mind, like it was a selling, selling off point for him. He seemed to opposition. suggest, just before maybe you answer my original question, in his eulogy, the president seemed to suggest that you are only patriotic if you do not oppose his style of governance. Did he, did he in the first place oppose the style of governor, governance of the previous president? Did he? Yes, he did. He opposed the style of governance of uh, Milton Obote. That is why he went to the bush and the others. Why does he think that he's uh, good, that he won't find those opposing him? You get it? Because to he me, confuses himself with the country. He yeah, doesn't know that you get it. loving the country is not loving him. That is it. So if he's expecting that everyone is not going to oppose him, then he's, he's being wrong to himself, not even to the country. Him talking about others who are radical, I'll personally also say, just people think that being radical is about talking within, from the mouth. I would say that him going to the bush with the guns, he was being radical. So that is, to me, that is it. He's also radical in his way. And again, we all have our style. Everyone is gifted different, uniquely different. Yes? And again, what different violences uh, push different people to react differently. Some might choose to do the way uh, Cecilia Ogwal uh, was uh, honorable, was doing her things. Others choose the different way. If either piece have failed, and again, remember, this is a military man. Our president is a military man. The type of governance he's having is military. So we should, he should expect radical people like the way he's judging. Um, and his, by the, his remarks around uh, uh, Chiagulani and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Dr. BCJ, the position he's in, he used the rightful words. Those are the rightful words, person I would expect from the president to his opposition. So it was a true reflection of his feelings. Yes, it was. The Bible says what we take inside doesn't destroy it, but what comes out of us is the true reflection of us. So he was really speaking out of his spirit, and that is him, and that is. I wouldn't expect anything him to say that you know BCJ is good, uh, Chagulani is good. No, I wouldn't. I would be even. I would ask myself, what is wrong with our president? Is he sick? Is he going through something? So his speech, uh, to me, I feel it was a selling point for him, a, cons a consoling. Sometimes we come to speak to people, trying to console ourselves. He was trying to console the hustler, his self, and maybe also the mourners. So back to the question, you were inquiring why? Today, we see a reversal of the progress, the strong progress that the likes of Cecilia Ogwal, the Miriam Tembes, and other champions of women empowerment 
and emancipation have registered over the years. Why is uh, that the case? First of all, politics and leadership of the country has become commercial. We all see it. And um, it is rare. That is why when I was saying, talking in the first place, I said it is rare and right now to find a Matembe or to find a Cecilia. And uh, sometimes away from being commercial, like I said, there is a lot of systematic and, and uh, structural um, structural um, structural um, in place that silence women. And uh, us voters, truly, I think we are the ones doing a problem to these people by giving them votes. We give them votes not knowing their capability. But because right now, let's say, very many women were voted on the card of NOP. I'm not trying to despise NOP, no. I'm not despising their leadership, no. But I feel very many leaders, women, women were voted when they have not yet built their muscle of leadership or being political leaders. There is a difference between being a woman human rights defender there's a difference between being when you're working in your in your in your in your constituency or area of work but again it takes courage it takes a unique difference of a woman to now become a, a voice I have a strong voice politically because there are a lot of things first of all women come from a uh, from patriarchal backgrounds, from their childhood, from where they've grown. And even where we are in the faces, you'll see that they always show where women have to stop. Yes? We have seen in different, um, we have seen in different uh, governances uh, of the president, women are elected there, but they are silenced. So we might be thinking that, okay, women are liberated, women have been given position, but in reality, women are more being silenced. There's a time a woman help me. Winfred. That is the question now we need to, we need to, I'll, I'll, let me come to that. There's a time when a woman MP, I've forgotten the name, when she came up and talked about a sexual harassment in parliament. Honorable Anna Decade Bill. And Hi. remember, if we can all remember how that discussion came up, how it ended. When, we, when they stood up and talked about, um, I talked about um, uh, consent, you saw how men were trying to shut and rubbish women. And I'm going back to, we are voting women who have not yet built the muscle of being political leaders. So it's a matter of They are capacity. doing, they have no, I'm not saying they don't have the capacity. Mm but they have not yet built their muscle to hold their space or hold their ground in the parliament or in the political arena. The second one, I said, we all, we all, we all feel for our country, but also it takes a woman like Cecilia or Matembe, like you mentioned, not to agree or not to settle into the corruption around in the country. I am a woman, but I will not say that every woman is not corrupt. But these are things they've found in the system. They've found the system already corrupt. They've found the system, and given that most of them, those who are not, because very many women are in parliament, but if it, when it comes to issues around corruption, issues around uh, women, how many would stand up and speak like Cecilia or even speak like Matembe? Right now, Matembe is out of parliament. But you can think she's also a member of parliament. Or you can even just want to say that she's one of our members of parliament because of the way she speaks with passion. Another thing, people feel, I feel the leaders we are having now in parliament, they went there for money, not, not to speak for our right. They went there for themselves. They went there to also eat, like Katolu Wama previously said, vote me nanging in the NDECO. So people are just there in parliament, feeling for themselves, feeling for their stomach, feeling for their families. But also as they feel for all that, 
I feel there's also a lot of fear in parliament, given that um, we are having now a speaker who is a woman, very commanding, very arrogant, very patriarchal. And to me, I would feel somehow it also, having a woman leader, you, these other women, we have very many other young women who also look unto those people. Having a woman in that position who is very patriarchal would also silence other women. Because remember, they are coming from patriarchal backgrounds. They are coming from patriarchal communities. They are coming from patriarchal societies. And again, having a woman in leadership who is patriarchal, I don't know what made her there. I believe she also, she's doing somehow good work for others, but that bit of patriarchal bit, it is a wrong side for me. I would feel it is a wrong side to have a woman being patriarchal in that position. Also will silence women. And also political parties. Last time um, the opposition side voted for the opposition leadership. How many women were there? I also feel uh, parties are not... Unless a woman has come when they already they already have the capacity, but parties need to go back to the commitment of building women's capacity, raising women's voices, but not having 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 what having just women there in their in their parties and they say they are women. All parties are somehow now lacking that. So there are very many factors contributing to 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 why we are having very many member of parliament and women who are silent but the first one the below one the first one the one i have put forward is we are voting it is us voters now to go back and check ourselves are we really voting the right women are we just looking at the books are we looking at the families they are coming from are we looking at the only things they've done for us there but we are not looking at how have they for the previous before we are voting them how are they speaking boldly to power truth to power have they built their muscle enough that even when i send them to parliament they will still influence the flow or still speak so that is to me that is where the problem is uh charity winfred here seems to split the blame between the polity and then the uh, women leaders themselves for their lack of commitment towards advancing the struggle for emancipation and liberation. But let me ask you, today, more than ever in our history, we have many women actually outnumbering men in the order of the national presidency, that hierarchy. We have a vice president, we have the speaker, we have the prime minister and the whole host of other you know, ministers and other positions. But then we seem to register a very dangerous trend. We no longer have uh, you know, assertive voices uh, advocating for that agenda. But be that as it may, even if they are, we do not see any tangible benefits. What could be the problem? One of the problems with the fact that, yes, we have women representative, uh, representatives across the board and in very influential positions, but not uh, pushing for the demands of the women movement, is that the new breed of leaders have not gone through the leadership training of the women movement. And they do not understand the agenda of the women movement. They also do not know the objectives and the values behind the movement. So why, even me when I joined it, you see, you can be a woman, but when you're thoroughly into politics only, you're not interested in the women movement and what the women movement is doing. You're more into politics. You want to know what's going on on the governance spectrum and that's it. You're just into governance. You want governance working well. And that's why you see you have a vice president. She's into governance. And you have a, 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 what's the, the, prime pri the prime minister. Because when the prime minister was approached, she said, you women, you did not support me. I did not see you supporting me to, to, to take this position. You are not very supportive of me. Okay? 
Now, that means that she, she has not been co-opted into the movement to understand what it's all about and what it does and what it, the, the, the bigger good for the girl child. Because I had expected that when the president pardoned all the people of defilement that came out with uh, the former boss of NSSF, Chandi Jamwa, I was expecting that these women leaders because if Cecilia Ogwal was the prime minister, she would have made a statement on the floor of parliament. She would have said, eh, so the rapists are now being left to go. And the defilers, in fact, not even rapists, the defilers, defilers. that young girls, what was the statement being released at that point? The statement being released at that point was that maybe defilement, the president will pardon it. He gave a prerogative of mercy for these people. But what does it mean? What message is he sending to other guys who are defiling? He's saying it's okay. You go ahead, defile. I will give you mercy. But isn't that the function of the uh, the whole concept? So, so, so this is what I'm saying. Of so the 13 to, to, and 11 to, are defiling. To exercise claimants, if it is uh, justified, I mean, uh, it could be murder, uh, it could be defiled. They are all offenses. You mean, why, why didn't he pick other corruption and financial, uh, financial loss? Uh, people who are there on financial loss. Why didn't he, okay, set free and some political, political prisoners. prisoners? Why didn't he, yes, uh, people on financial loss, corruption, political, why did it have to be defilement? Why did the whole list come with defilement? And okay, so rapists. Now, that, that, at least rapists, but that even has at a least. story. Uh, defilement is young girls. These are girls between young. the age of 13 and 18. The constitution says these are children. So what are you saying? You're saying you're not caring about children. Imagine how I am now making this statement, me, 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 because I'm coming from the women rights movement. But had I been the prime minister, I would prepare my statement very well on the floor of parliament and cause debate around the fact that, okay, when the president is giving prerogative of Masa, which he is entitled to do constitutionally, it's within his right, he should also remember the factors around these issues. What does it mean? And how are we perceiving it? That is why for FIDA now, they've taken up the issue. But you've not had the Speaker of Parliament raising the issue. You've not had the Vice President raising the issue. You've not had the Prime Minister raising the issue. So there is going to be a need of um, training, co-opting them into what the women's rights movement is all about and why they stand for the rights of young girls and women. Uh, the Honorable Cecilio Gual stood for young girls and women because he believed that the future was female. That as we go ahead, you may find that girls are more than boys and sometimes they will be leaders tomorrow. What kind of leadership values do they espouse? What are they bringing on board that would make the country a better place to be? And what kind of leaders will they be? When Mabati scandal came out here, the first thing that was clear on the scandal was that majority of the thieves were women. That, eh, we didn't know that women can also steal. This is what was trending. So what was it saying? In terms of the women rights movement, then the question would have been, what kind of leaders are we training? What do we need to do differently? How do we inspire girls and, and, and younger women to think about leadership? Is it just that we shall trend for theft of Mabati or there are other things that have been achieved. So these are the things that we expect conversations to be around. And the Honorable Cecilia Ogwal, the Honorable Miriam Atembe continually had these conversations even as they remained on the leadership spectrum, which we don't see with the more political uh, uh, and governance heads in the prime minister and... Uh, uh, the vice president and also the speaker. They are more onto governance and not necessarily just the issues. Thank you, Charity. Focus on Parliament now takes a short break. We'll see you back after the break. National Water and Sewage Corporation is committed to providing cost-effective, clean, safe, and reliable quality water and sewage solutions in urban centers across Uganda. National Water and Sewage Corporation reaffirms its commitment to 100% service coverage, geographical expansion, infrastructure development, water quality, pro-poor initiatives, customer care and stakeholder engagement, catchment and water source protection.
Be a water hero. Pay your bills to zero balance. Report all leaks, busts, and illegal water connections to enable us serve you better. Reach us through our toll-free numbers on 0800-200-977 or 0800-300-977. You can also communicate with us through any of our online platforms or visit the National Water and Sewerage Corporation office nearest to you. This message is brought to you by National Water and Sewerage Corporation. Welcome back. This is the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV. Today, we discuss and celebrate the legacy of the Honorable Cecily Ogwal, the late and former Member of Parliament representing Dokolo District. Joining me to make a sense of this discussion is a pen of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Council, I want to understand uh, charity here strongly argues that it could be a question uh, for maybe the structure or institutional bottlenecks that are straddling the path of advancing the women's rights movement in the country, a view that is also shared by Winifred. But let us look at the political space. Today, more than ever, again, we have a women better place to advocate strongly for these rights and also for their continued uh, emancipation and empowerment. But why is it the case that uh, increasingly there is uh, you know, a lack of confidence in the ability and competencies of the women leaders, despite uh, the so many incentives that have been made in the past, uh, the affirmative <coughs> action in areas like education and politics by uh, you know, introducing the position of the woman member of parliament, what could be the exact issue? Is it a question of the personalities that are being fronted to lead? Is it a question of uh, lack of sufficient capacity building? What's the problem? Or it's the general politics? No, this is beyond. Of course, the politics can't go away. It's part of the problem. But it's uh, part of it is the historical injustice. This is not a new problem. It is probably getting worse. But even before I get into the structural riddles, I want to also make my opinion very clear on the president pardoning the fighters enemies. It's like he was pro looking out for them to pardon them. You see, thank then, you very much, Council Yeah, we, we need to know why. What is thank his motivation? You, why is he propagating the I fire love men using the president, who think like this. Using the office of the president to encourage the firemen in the country. This water belongs mm. to you. But After cancel. here, I'll Thank take you. a couple yeah. of you. Are, you are, you're, you're a champion of us. The, the Norman. The, the concept of let me let, let, let me give you the ramifications of, of the fire exactly. of, of course, that's, 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 why to, that's why you should listen. That's why you should listen to me more. Yes. Because I'm a human rights constitutional lawyer who has read the constitution from page one to the last. I know about the prerogative of master. It's not an excuse for fatalizing gender-based violence. Thank you in, so in much, Council. Just because you're president. Defilement is a form of egregious torture. It must be discouraged. It's a discouraged not with words, but with action and with what you don't do. If someone defiles and you tell them that despite your conviction, despite your sentencing, I'm saying you go. And I'm, and you're not, and I'm not telling only one defiler, but a number of them. Then that is a policy. By the way, the president does affect policy of his regime. So right now we can say that NRM has a policy of encouraging defilement in Uganda. And I have evidence, not from the ROC one of some remote village, which has no literature about women's rights, but from the highest echelon of the state. Defilement is violence. And why do you know that we are led by a violent leader who captured power through violence? At least I know that he should be, his sufficient gender-based violence is one that is supposed to be fought rather than encouraged. The only message you're sending out to women, including my mother and my daughters, by pardoning the fighters and the mass in one and one hand pen is that it's okay. It's all right. Go it's ahead. Okay. 
Do it to those little girls. When you do it, even if courts convict you, you stand a chance of the president coming for you and you will not be summarizing. You will be having a history, a record on which to rely. This, I don't know even the medicine for this, but if there was something that could be undone, and it can't be legally almost, I mean, I don't see how he can... You can't undo it. He, even him, he can't undo that. It's gone. It's spirit milk, but it is wrong. It is deplorable. It is immoral. So back to your question. I think this was not very comfortable for you. No, no, no. Before yeah. with understanding the president's motive that he was advised, we tell him many things every day. If you know us, why did he allow the fire the fires to go? It's a team of the fires. It's a football team that he has unleashed on the population. You get me? It's a full sport team. <laughs> you get me? This is not excusable. You can't take away it away from the president. No. You see, the president is given many things, many briefs, intelligence briefs, but if it is his decision, it's like him assenting to a law and you tell me that you blame the attorney general. Yes, the attorney general is to be blamed, but so is the president. When a president signs a proclamation, an order, a decree, he has the ultimate responsibility. That's why we go into elections. In the countries where elections go, they choose the leaders who they think are meritorious. You get me? And these are some of the things. So that you don't go and sign these types of decrees. But once you're there, then you are who you are. There is a time when we had Amin, you know how he conducted himself. We had Benaisa, we had Obata, now we have Museven. He's unleashing the fighters and the preparation. It is him. Next. My original question. Hmm. Why is it the case? <laughs> <laughs> So you almost digressed entirely. <laughs> I mean, no, that is women rights. That is women rights. That is girl rights. Oh. That is human rights. It's and, very and, and you see, when it is torture, that is it. It is a non-derogable right. That is it. Rape and defilement are common weapons of war, but they are among the things that make it a war crime. Or oh, they are unforgivable. Again. They are a form of torture. Even the war that they are celebrating today, the conclusion of which that we are that some people are celebrating today, it used as one of their weapons, including that cast the NRM, NRA soldiers used rape as a weapon of war. Little wonder that their leader, years later, is pardoning the fighters. So I'm not entirely surprised. I'm shocked that someone of that responsibility is, has not graduated from the bush war mentality, guerrilla kind of thinking into the president that he is supposed to be. Uh, 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 so we need hostility against such acts. They are abhorrent, they are unacceptable, they are forms of torture. They shock the conscience of humanity. That's why not only my conscience, but even the mic shook, shook and temporarily <laughs> was switched off. <laughs> It is just shattering. It is shattering. It is shattering and you had her, like it is freezing. These things are just sacrilegious. You get me? Religiously speaking, when they say something is sacrilegious, is it's an example of sacrilegious blasphemy. It is just anyway, words fail me. That's why we must go to the oh. <laughs> the next question because I can't describe <coughs> the pain, the the, uh, the 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 horrendous character, the preposterous nature of the president pardoning a, a football team of the fighters. No, it's a serious issue. I now grasp. But uh, let's go back to the original question. I was asking that despite the uh, number of interventions and incentives that have been. Uh, registered to facilitate women empowerment and liberation and advancement and with the now new breed of women leaders at the highest level of state power and hierarchy 
how come that uh, we cannot draw the linkage uh, presently between you know uh, the benefits and the incentives? What could be the issue? You see, what must change is not only institutions and laws, it is a culture of the people, as long as we still have patriarchy. And you should know that the historical injustice cannot be cured um, in a matter of days. It's like racism. You get me? It's, it takes long because it's... Uh, Kwame Nkrumah talking about the effects of colonialism. So the worst form effects of colonialism were mental mm. and psychological. For that psychological uh, torment, long after the physical form of violation has gone away, the psychological one remains and it can even surprisingly be passed on to succeeding generations. So this structural injustice is still here partly because it was so historically entrenched that people, the society has not completely broken the chains of that injustice against women. Even men, some of whom speak liberally in public, they go home and recoil to their patriarchal character. Unfortunately, even some ladies take on the patriotic garb. They, they put on patriotic, patriarchy clothes once they're in position of power. So it is deep-seated, but the problems must be real. They cannot be cosmetic. You cannot just throw a law at a problem of a structure injustice. You must really mean it. You must be more deliberate. So what are you really doing to ensure that the women who get degrees are employed? You give that's them not position. enough. That's you not give enough. Them position that's not government. enough. If they go to parliament mm -hmm. and they are sexually harassed, it's so not just the Anne, but even Matienda has ever alluded to that sexual hostility that some female members get in parliament. And it's not just parliament, even in the cabinet, it's there. And we are talking about the top echelons. You get me? Even some other organs of government that we are not going to talk about, it's there. In the private sector, it's also as bad. In schools, in hospitals, patients are being sexually harassed. Students are being sexually harassed. Get me? In universities. So it has not gone away. It has not gone away. And we need to be stronger than just throwing laws, uh, institutions. We must, it must be a movement. That's why. Even political leaders must come and listen to the movement leaders. Correct. What does it mean? What do women really want? So that we are guided, women are at the forefront of providing solutions. And we listen to them. But if we brush them aside, then that's not true. When you are, as a president, you are appointing women, are you appointing the best or the weakest to your cabinet? It's not a matter of decorating leaders of opposition with the female humanists. If you really are about liberating women, you need to pick the best of them. You need to empower them with the knowledge. You need to respect them. And the atmosphere must be conducive. Laws are not enough. A culture itself must change. The culture itself must change. If, if people in our homesteads are still looking at women, children, female children as sources of wealth, I mean as people whom they can trade and get cows, that is the, it's a deep problem, you get me? And it's our culture, it's our custom, that, uh, or I mean in some countries that the people look at bride wealth, as a, even they start planning for it, there are some women who are pressured into marriage. Hmm? That you are delaying. Where do you want your brother to get cows to marry from? Oh, but this one, what is she even still doing here? You people, you have not heard of these things? Hmm? That, wh what is, hey, but in, where is the man? The person has come for At, Christmas. Five, the first question eh, they are asking. <laughs> yeah, yes, when you, are you getting married? Mm -hmm, yes, we see the cow, we see, you know where. Mm -hmm. And you, you have a job, you finished school, but where is the man? We need to stop asking those silly questions to our daughters. 
exactly and then when when she's going into a political office you start saying if she has no man then she's not worth being a political leader so what? there is a bishop who even reached an extent of trying to fire a clergy female clergy because she was married to a polygamous man what mm. was she supposed to do it wasn't her fault the man <laughs> went out and got a second woman and he said now according to church canons you were in a polygamous marriage you go How do we start punishing women for the sins of their husbands? They are fathers. And then later once the bishop realized that the women movement was up in arms, he said there is more to this story than meets the eye. What was there that meets was more Which to eyes the eye? did she want them that, to meet? That that the woman might have been polygamous herself before. Why, why hadn't it been raised? And why is he Why was the story now Why is he guessing? Up? Why is he guessing a might? You see? So we need to start with ourselves the, the it issue is, of patriarchy is still real it's deeply entrenched the laws are not enough we must go ahead and ensure that culture changes but the atmosphere changes where are the assertive voices the likes of the late honorable cecilia ogwa the likes of and the, my question of, is of, of, if of, you don't listen to cecilia ogwa mm-hmm. you don't listen to miriam atembe you don't listen to the strong women you only listen to your girlfriends your side chicks the people you are frying on with on the brain that is not the liberation of women you get me women cannot be liberated by being sex objects by sexualizing them no they cannot be liberated by sitting on the table of decision making and their decision is valid that's why we need the best women in the cabinet in the parliament and not the weakest links that some people are, are talking about and that has to be deliberate it has to be encouraged but if they reach cabinet and you sexual harass them they reach parliament you sexual harass them they reach here you don't listen to them it doesn't matter the laws you have the whatever the policies you are proclaiming because actually the test of the padding is in the eating if we really want our women to matter then we should make their voices matter, matter. There is no way of going around about it. Mm. We should do this thing to them. <clears throat> one thing that Aaron even raised a bit before, he said uh if you look at the honorable Cecilia Ogwal, she was on the political scene for 28 years. It means that her husband must have been very support- supportive of the processes that she was engaged with and that even the people she met along the way, she didn't give them a chance to manipulate her but she also did not manipulate them and so there must be that space there must be space where that woman can put out her best under respectful circumstances both at home at the workplace and wherever she's associating with these people understand that she's also a human being in her own right it's not just because she carries around certain things about her so you're now going to think about her in terms of sexual object only no today I, i i i made a comment about nrm and i said you see the nrm is a mixed basket and when it went out on social media one young man tweeted and said i feel sorry for the ones who sleep with you sexual object already you see so she is there sexually like sexualizing your comments. yes that because i said <laughs> the nrm has done some good things and has done some bad things it's a mixed fruit basket and the good things i enumerated them i feel sorry for those who sleep with you i became a sexual object because of what i said and it is a grave thing it is really grave when i first read it i wanted to react then i said if a pig drags you into the soil you don't roll along with the pig i let the pig uh, and that pig thing reminds me of one thing uh, the wangari mathai story one thing you should know what is holding us back is that why you men face challenges in political arena and like human rights arena women normally face twice thrice more True. if you look at what wangari mathai went through it's because maybe at least matembe has written the, the challenge of more, there is a poor writing culture here but if you are reading the stories that women go through at their workplaces in the political organs you find that they have higher obstacles higher mountains to climb and yet what they need is a leveled playing field not just laws and institutions 
and flowered speeches you know real <coughs> level the ground wangari mathai was called the mad they were saying that she's a man we need to disabuse of ourselves of the notion that if women is if a woman is succeeding is outspoken and she's a man no she's a woman mm-hmm. she has not to become a man mm-hmm. she's just a brilliant woman just they are dominant and brilliant men you get me so also the men we need to liberate ourselves before as we, to liberate to, to for women to, liber, to be liberated even men must be liberated from insecurity for example we should not be intimidated by outspoken ladies like the ones we are here we should know that they mean well for us that we benefit from having strong women it is in our interest to have strong women ask families and children of educated women they 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 feed better they they live longer just because women are educated women are empowered nations are much better but here are some people fearing as if it's going to be a crisis if this woman is strong if this woman is in this space we also need to show our own fears as men a relative strong liberated empowered women thank you counsel i realize that uh this conversation today's conversation is much more than the ordinary ones it has now expanded beyond the scope of simply eulogizing the late honorable city of god but these are the but things she fought so. about mm. these are the so things she stood for so we are focusing on why did she have to stand for these things because she knew there were going to be women there were going to be young girls who would be coming to follow in her footsteps and they needed a voice at the time and now that we lose her voice can many more women voices rise to defend the space that she defended so that's it's not going beyond her tribute all this is in tribute for the work well done quite significant thank you weni <coughs> we are talking about women participation in the political space uh in parliament today <coughs> we have a significant um number of women politicians uh the members of parliament but then the question is in terms of the variables women legislators uh you know contributing to policy matters or even fronting uh legislative proposals for consideration and adoption by uh the house uh we do not see it as that frequent so is that a question of um capacity because now council here says that strongly it's a question of culture and the society's attitude towards the women's rights movement but now when those uh, more sophisticated places what's what's the challenge what's the bottleneck there i would still tell you that before i answer that i must add my voice to what everyone has said about the president is a decision of course i have to add my voice as a, as a woman human rights defender <laughs> it's, it's ah, the most predominant issue <laughs> yeah. the president says that uh, he believes in uh, he's a, he's a, he's a christian he saved are there is a time are there is a time because is defilement he, you have i i can't that. say that he is but he he says he is so i go at his what with what he, he says who am i to who am I to 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 judge someone's belief and there is a time where paul was telling uh, galatians you foolish uh, galatians who are they were not uh, obeying the truth so when we talk about issues around violence towards women and uh, defilement is is now a violence not only to that girl child but to the future because now these are young girls so to me i go back i'm not saying the president is a fool but i'm now referring him being a, and the committee whatever whoever was involved in that process of releasing 90 11 defilers of the 13 pardon persons i'll take them back to that and quote them that uh, that that uh, i refer them to to the people paul was speaking to that you foolish leaders of uganda you're paying a deaf ear to the truth of the impacts of violence towards women towards girls so i personally i would add a voice to other persons who have stood up to speak 
against the action of the president and openly tell the president, <coughs> yes, you're a leader, you have, um, you have the powers to do what you did, but feel for the future. He has to, here he didn't feel for the future. The president did feel for the future. The president did feel for the, uh, for the girl child. The president, to me, was he joking? Was he out of his mind? What was wrong there? There is a lot of questions to ask. Council uh, seems president. to be convinced that he was yes. deliberate in his decision. <laughs> By the way, the president of Uganda sometimes, to me, I think maybe he was even trying to trying to show that, okay, I can even do worse things to our country. Let me try it out and bring that. It is now how they were releasing. When the, now I'm, I'll take him back to the Bible where he says he believes in. Remember that time when people, was it Barnabas? When, when, the, when, the, when Pilate said, can I release Jesus or? Barnabas. So the, now the president was like, let me show you that I can do worse things. Because this is something worse. Truth is, I don't know how he feels. I don't know how he felt when he was deciding that. But to me, I feel it was like sending a message that you people, like silencing us. I can do worse things than the ones you're saying that I've done. Let me release the defilers. Let me pardon the defilers. Nothing you can do to me. So it, I, call, I, I call upon him to rethink about his action. Let him rethink about the action of pardoning defilers. Ah, they were talking, even me just talking about it, even me just feeling up, my, my, my blood, my heart, everything is boiling within me. Eh? And I'm like, really? Now, remember, this is now the chairperson of NAM. So not only Ugandans should fear for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> the chairperson now releases and pardons defilers. Eh? So... He's have... unleashing a problem on the whole <sighs> organization. Let me leave that point around defilers because every, anything around violence and violence towards women, because remember, the Bible says, people always miss it and preach when they say women came from the rib. Yes, women came from the rib of men, but men, it is even quoted in the Bible, men come from women. So the president came from a woman. A woman who was once a, a girl child, who was once a child, and now the president is pardoning defilers of young girls. And it's because of a woman that the president is now a president. He's being unserious. Mr. President, you're being unserious. So back to the question. Uh, why, why women are not active? The invisible participation of the women in the political space despite their presence. Why is that the case? And before she comes in, do you know that the very few victims of defilement and rape are willing to come out? Do you even know that they've been even advocating about the, own, the process in court, how it is? You're the lawyers. If already the process has been a problem, in court that people don't even come to testify. And now the it is very uniquely difficult to get a conviction. For rape. For rape, for defilement. Even for defilement. There is non-cooperation from witnesses. Then there is fear of victims to report before you even go any further. Mm. Because it is stigmatizing to be known or to declare yourself as a victim of rape or defilement. Even during the cross-examination, the questions they're asking you, so what did he do? Mm. He, he, he made you do what? And how did he do it? And you have to go through the whole graphic thing in, through your mouth to while it is also in audio. your head. Mm. You imagine the torture. And these are the things we talk about every time we talk about women violence. Every time we have a, a week on gender-based violence. The first time I attended that that week, I was saying, where are we even going there? What are we doing? When I start to hear the stories of the young girls and young women, I left saying, oh my God, this is so exhausting. So it people is... are not aware. And Violet. there is need for raising this awareness. This is what the Honorable Cecilia Ogwal was doing. 
And this is what women leaders need to continue to do. So the challenge she has left for Jen Ruth Acheng, <coughs> for her daughter, Annette, Anita Among, because she called them her daughter when she released that last video. She said, this is to my daughters who made sure I come to hospital here in India to get treatment. I love you very much, my daughters. This is a challenge she leaves to those two young ladies and many others that she influenced, that the women rights issues are key issues for us to pay attention to if we want a good society. That when Fredia help us understand why, for instance, they are not doing what is expected of them now that they occupy the high positions. I already talked about the, the structures, the patriarchy, but again, I won't say that. I won't also leave out the choice bit. We choose either to be bold or we choose not to be bold. Yes, there are other, there are always ob obstacles, like we've said, which are structural, which are systematic. But again, if we've been having women like Cecilia, it means at some point you have to make a choice. There is a reason why someone would choose to come into human rights. There is a reason why one should choose, chooses to come into politics. There is a reason why someone chooses to go into, leave alone those ones who are forced to go into summer, summer careers. Uh, there is a reason why people who make choices, but especially around politics and uh, around rights, there is always a reason behind. There is always a story that pushes someone to join things of human rights. There is always a story that chooses that someone pushes someone to join um, governance. So if we have we've been having women like a parliament which had uh, Cecilia, Honorable Cecilia, Honorable Matembe, Winnie Bianima, other women, and they would speak up. I believe they also had challenges. I know they also had systematic as uh, uh, structure, culture. All those challenges were there. But because of the love and passion, passion, there is a difference between loving women's rights and having passion. So the passion has went over time. It's not about over time. It is them. Let's not confuse the time and the person. The time is there and the time will always be there, but the person is a person. So to me, what I'm saying, Speaking to power boldly and standing up to raise your voice without being either uh, either um, silenced or even um, choosing to to not talk about some issues because we have seen these women speak about some issues. Let me give you an example. When they were the common now last year, the common the common law that was passed in Parliament was aha. All those women stood up and spoke, which means they can choose to speak about other issues. If they could choose to speak about the anti-homosexuality law, they can still choose to speak about other issues. Issues. To me, I go back, it is a choice. Yes, there are things that might be silencing them. Maybe some are already, already under captive. I've never been in those spaces, but I hear some people are already under captive. They're not supposed to speak. Maybe some already sold their soul, their powers. People, remember Bobby Wayne when he was in, uh, in, uh, in, in London, he said very many members of parliament who came under the, uh, the NOP card are already bought by. I can't guarantee, but I'm saying maybe. Because what the passion these women use when they're on the ground, choose asking for, 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 for votes. They always even refer to the problems in the constituencies. They'll speak directly. If you choose me, I am going to fight this. I am going, they raise all the point. They're very articulate. And voters vote them. What, where does, where, who takes away that passion and boldness? When I say that it's capacity, personally here, I'm not a lawyer. I have never gone to any law school. But because of my story, because of the things I've gone through, because of the stories of others, I boldly speak. I boldly speak. 
I become radical about issues of violence. That is why when, when I was even talking about the president's action, I was, it was coming from within. I tried to control myself because I'm on camera. If it's issues around violence. So no one can convince me that a woman enters there and they can't speak if it's not their choice. They are choosing either to be silent. Yes, there are those who are silenced because of the violence that is going on within. But can we have some woman stand up and say, you know what? Within the chambers, within the parliament, within the, uh, the systems, men are violating us. Women will come out and support that woman. Like how... Um, Charity told you, very many, very many legislators and women have, have not passed through the feminists and the women's movement. Yes, they have the capacity. But if you have not gotten the chance or given yourself a chance to pass through the feminist and women's movement, the fear from the patriarchy you were raised from will always, whenever you stand up to want to speak about an issue, will always silence you and tell you that women are supposed to raise issues in this way. Some are coming from religious backgrounds where they will tell you, where the Bible will always somewhere tell you that women are not supposed to speak in this way. You know, so like how Charity told you, if these women can, because even if, the movement came and tried to say that, okay, we are going to train these women. We are going to uh, try and nurture and, and, and mentor these women until it's their personal choice. Until it's their personal choice, we shall still have the same women we are having now. So yes, those other obstacles are there, but it's still them to raise above that bar, the buzz of other harassment. Because the Matembes, the Cecilias have shown us that it can be possible on the floor of parliament to sp still speak truth to power. These women need to decide and raise their voices. Mm, you're quite one of those passionate <laughs> women rights defenders, not the ones we have in parliament, I presume. Uh, charity. In two minutes, I'm going to ask you to uh, give us perspective on how to boost women democratic uh, participation, because uh, we understand from the history of the late Honorable Siri Ogwal, she was a strong leader in the UPC, in the FDC. At a certain point, she was even, uh, you know, the primary leader. Uh, to champion the cause for the restoration of multi-party politics in the country, galvanizing so many other political forces in the opposition politics of the country. What can we do practically uh, to enhance women democratic participation in the country? In two minutes, as you give your parting shot. The same question I will ask Council and Winfred as we conclude. So um, elections are coming up soon. Um, 2025 already will have some pockets of elections for young people. Those will be youth elections. And then we shall move into the general election in 2026. One of the things that has kept away women has been the question of financial inclusion, that they don't have the muscle and that uh, registration fees are high up there expectations from them in terms of the family and running around the constituencies, fundraising, uh, come with a cost of sexualizing the whole story around their uh, urge to stand for office. We need to deal with ourselves as society, get rid of sexual comments around women that want to go into leadership, but become more supportive of them. If we are their brothers, let's support them. If we are their uh, uncles, let's support them. If we are their sisters, let's support them. So women support structures need to be grown around those who have interest in joining leadership. For me, that is my parting shot. Thank you, Charity. Council. Remind me of the question. On the question of women democratic participation. 
today? Uh, the level must be, the, the ground must be leveled. Because in a militarized atmosphere, you will scare away more women than men because women are more vulnerable. For example, we know the tool of rape and environment is only available against women. Okay, predominantly. And we must break the customary barriers also, including the religious barriers that train women in to be subservient for all of their lives, to be subordinate for all of their lives. Because politics requires um, charisma, requires boldness, and Uganda's politics even requires being fraudulent, being violent. So we must have women who are aggressive, who are shrewd, and stop deceiving our ladies that they must be meek, humble, uh, good mannered, and so on and so forth. They have really, it's an ugly terrain. They really have to, 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 to strengthen, to toughen up uh, in, 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 in order to, 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 to climb these really mountainous terrains. Because who are the women that have done it? They are rock solid. We are talking about Wangari Mathai, Winnie Mandela, Miriam Matembe. All those people are solid, they are loud, and they are not humble. So we must disabuse the, our young ladies of a notion that they are supposed to be very humble. They should speak sorry, quietly. No, they should occupy even literally the front seats. They should ask for no one's permission to participate in it. They should just live their dreams. They should live their dreams. They should break barriers and they should be rebels if they really want to participate in it. In, in the processes that are available. Because for them, even they start on a disadvantage. And so they need even to put in more effort. They need to be even more aggressive. They need to be louder than the men, if possible, outshout the men. That's how they're going to succeed. But if a woman is going to come and just do lipstick and then look like this and just be humble and just be sexy, that's not going to, <laughs> to help you. No, it's going to get you nowhere. You, we need more from our women as well. That's the choice part. But for society, they must remove these customary barriers, religious confusion that uh, who tricks women into thinking that they must know that the politics matter, that the life on earth is very important, not just in heaven, not just when you're dead. You get me? We must stop telling lies to these young ladies. We must start telling them the truth. Mm. I hope they listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. Just really short. Okay. On the concept of women democratic participation in the present context. I want to encourage every woman who is, uh, who is um, because the elections are soon coming, like Charity told you, I want to encourage you that you have the full support. You have the full support. Uh, just be yourself, uh, speak as uh, truth to power, don't be intimidated. And then the other thing I would say is, um, I think we need to create more spaces of healing, healing from the different traumas uh, these women have, have been carrying from years. Because maybe these traumas also get them to be silenced uh, during that time when they get into those positions. But still, let's learn from the past. Let's have uh, at the back of our minds those strong women, those brilliant and brave women who have always been speaking truth to power boldly. And let's borrow that and stand up and stand up to the women, all the women, even now those in parliament. Let them not fear. They should know that they have a full support of Women movement, very many feminists are, re are, re are ready to support them. But being humble and being silent is only going to cause us more violence and only going to kill and take back the women where they were. I want to appreciate you, ladies and gentlemen, for your very able participation on this program. Once again, to our esteemed audience, we appreciate you for keeping us company up to the conclusion of this program. This has been the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV. Please feel free to engage us on our 
various social media platforms. You can subscribe on our channel on YouTube, follow us on X and on Facebook, and we appreciate our production unit for keeping us live up to the end of the program. We'll see you next time.